Please be seated. Wake up. Wake up. We've had we've been sleeping an hour later here, right? All the time change and hopefully we're getting into it, but it's still a little groggy. Wake up. That is one of the most elemental things that can be said and yet we don't say it enough, especially as Christians. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about Amos. I'm going to talk a little about the gospel too. And I'm sure as good Episcopalians, you have all committed to memory Amos. That's one of those books that Episcopalians regularly study, (laughs) reflect on, pray about. I know we've all got it. We don't tend to reflect on it because it's not a happy book. In fact, it's a pretty miserable book. It's sort of a, we have a little bit of a quick glance at it today, and it is one of those really harsh kind of books. In fact, it's the harshest book probably in the Old Testament. It's also the oldest of the prophets. So let me give you a quick history for those of you who haven't memorized it or studied it regularly. Amos was a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom was Judah, but he was in the northern kingdom. And he was the first of the prophets, the first to write down any sort of prophecies of what was going to happen. Before this, you had the judges and those guys who would make prayer, who would pray, someone like Samuel, who would always say about the same prayer, don't worry, the day the Lord is with you and the armies will triumph. The day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord always meant that God was going to beat the guys that you were fighting or the other people that you didn't like. God was going to push back those things and he was on your side. That was the day of the Lord. Amos comes along and literally flips it on its head and says, "Uh uh-oh, no, no, day of the Lord is not that. It's the exact opposite, and you don't want him coming near. But anyway, Amos is preaching and teaching in the northern kingdom in 750 or so B.C. That's, you know, 2,800 years ago, give or take, that he was preaching and teaching. And he was preaching this idea that really Israel had messed up. Not that God was on their side, but they had messed up. They had focused on the wrong thing. They had been focusing on themselves. They thought they had it all figured out, but in reality, they had it all backwards and upside down. He did what actually, he started a prophetic tradition that would continue all the way through John the Baptist and even into the present day. You have to focus on the right things if you want God on your side. You have to focus on the right stuff. Otherwise, bad things will happen. So whenever you hear someone make one of those ridiculous claims about how, I don't know, the hurricane was caused because um, Obama didn't do something, it's Obama's fault. Well, that actually goes back to Amos, believe it or not. He was the one who started this process and said, when bad things happen, it's because you aren't doing the right thing. He's the one who started teaching this, and we've been trying to extricate ourselves from it ever since. But here's the deal. His teaching was unbelievably specific and clear. He had one idea about what God cared about, and it was not what Jeroboam and the northern kingdom was concerned about. Their concern was about expanding the kingdom, about being in charge, about having everything go their way. Uh, Amos said, that's great, but that's not what God wants. God wants something completely different. Now, I'm going to put you all on the spot. What do you think that is? What do you think God wants versus what we want in a kingdom? Love. Love. Yes, that's a good answer. What else? Oh, come on, anything. Be nice. That's not a bad one. Justice. Justice. Absolutely. God is concerned with justice and specifically for Amos, and he spends the entire book saying it over and over again, the measure of a kingdom, of God's kingdom, is how you treat the least. He starts that conversation. He is the one who proclaims it first, and it's been proclaimed ever since by every prophet, every teacher, every rabbi, and every priest that the church has had or, the, or Judaism has had. That's how we measure God's justice. How do we deal with the least in our society? If we don't pay attention to how we do that, then we are liable to be judged. And when Amos says judged, he's very clear. He says, this isn't going to be a good day. It's going to be like when you go home and you think everything's perfect, you lay down on your couch, all's great, and then a rattlesnake bites you in the hand. (laughs) 
Or it's going to be like, uh uh-oh, I thought something terrible was going to happen. I run away from a lion, and you walk in your house, and there's a bear to maul you. It's going to be sort of like the Alanis Morissette ironic song all over again. (laughs) Bad to worse every time you turn around. And incidentally, it's not ironic. None of those are definitions of ironic. I have to say that as an English major. But (laughs) that is Amos's idea throughout that we have to be about caring for the least or we're not doing it right. And then he goes on to say that God doesn't even care about how you pray anymore or worship anymore. And this is one of those things we have to unpack very carefully because we're not saying, please do not hear Amos say that you don't have to come to church next Sunday. (laughs) In fact, quite the opposite. What he's saying is that worship matters, but because we aren't doing stuff during the week, we don't have it right. The best definition of this was Jesus himself. We get this one really wrong. The money changers, the famous story of the money changers where Jesus flips over all of those money changers and drives them out with whips and they say famously we all know this line right you have made this a den of thieves it's supposed to be a house of prayer but you've made it a den of thieves right for some reason that has been interpreted as oh that means we're not supposed to sell things at church but that's not it what is a den what is a lion's den what is a den really about it's a place where someone feels safe so they can go out and do the things that they're not supposed to do somewhere else So Jesus' complaint when he drives out the money changers is that not that they're doing anything wrong in that moment, but that the whole temple of God is messed up because people think they can come and pray and God will forgive them and then go do whatever they want during the week. That's, That's his critique. That's what makes him furious. He sees people taking advantage of the poor and the sick and the lost and then coming into the kingdom and saying, it's all fine. I got it all figured out. God loves me more than you. It's the exact opposite. And it comes straight from Amos through the tradition over and over again. The same is true, believe it or not, with the 10, bri- the ten um, oh, bridesmaids. There we go. I, can't, I almost went the wrong way. But the 10 women who are gathered and they are waiting with their lamps to greet the Lord. And it's fascinating how we interpret that because we hear it and when there are five who are wise and five who are foolish and they The wise are said to have brought extra oil. The foolish didn't bring extra oil, right? That's the part that we hear about. And so we tend to, most people preach about the oil and being prepared and the oil might be faith and the oil might be this. Except for I think we're focusing on the wrong thing there, the same way we focus on the wrong thing almost everywhere else. It's sort of like the old story where there was a nun who was at a Catholic school And she wrote a sign on the um, cafeteria line. There was a big bowl of apples, and she very carefully wrote out a sign that said, Take one only, God is watching. And so one of the kids goes to the line, takes the apple, goes to the end of the line, and then he gets out a piece of paper and writes very carefully and puts a sign next to the cookies and says, Take all you want, God's watching the apples. Of course, God can watch both. Of course, God watches all. But we think we can focus on one thing when we really should be focusing on another. And in this case, the for me, the key for those five foolish bridesmaids is not necessarily that they didn't bring oil. It's not that they fell asleep. All ten fall asleep waiting for God because he takes too long, waiting for the groom to come home. They all get tired and exhausted, as we all probably get tired and exhausted. No, the key is they decide to leave because they think the oil is more important than the groom. They decide that matters more than Jesus himself come near. Instead of focusing on God and what God wants of us in the kingdom, we get sort of, well, we fall asleep. We focus on other silly things here and there. Amos tells us to wake up. Justice needs to roll down like river. It needs to roll over everything and clean it up. We need to realize that God wants us to care for the sick, the poor, the hungry, the lost, the prisoner. All those things that our society still say don't matter. And why do I say that? We say it doesn't matter because of our economic policy, because of our legal policy. Just about everything you can imagine says that those who are least don't matter. 
And yet as Christians, as part of this faith, God says, wake up. Amos says, wake up. Jesus says, wake up. The parables say, wake up. Pay attention to what God cares about. Not what we want to care about, but what God truly loves and cares about. Wake up and be God's people. Wake up and do something, which is the trickiest part of all, isn't it? It's not just be awake and be aware, but actually go out and care for the poor, the homeless, the sick, and the lost. Wake up and pray and worship God, realizing that our worship in here is supposed to impact out there. And that actually is what Amos is critiquing. Not how dare you worship God. But how dare you worship God and think it doesn't matter out there? If you promise God to love here, then you darn well better sure love out there. And actually, I'm pointing to the courtyard. It's probably out there, right? The parking lot, (laughs) the rest of the world. That's what God calls us to be about. Wake up, my fellow Christians. Wake up and be a sign of God's love in this broken world. Wake up and enact it in so many ways. Wake up and volunteer for those organizations that, can, that need our help and our work. Wake up and build up this service. Help invite people in here to help them see that God's love can make a difference in the world, should make a difference in the world, will make a difference in the world. Wake up, my brothers and sisters. Wake up and do God's work. It's good stuff. It's good things to do. And I promise you won't regret it, but wake up. Amen.